<clears throat> this morning, I, I want to hopefully deliver a message that is one of hope and, and strength. Um, you know, everybody wants to be successful in life. You know, said nobody ever I hope that I'm a major failure. You know, I, that, that's just, that's not the way we are wired. And as you live your life, you know, understand that every morning that you wake up is a fresh start. That if you have been a failure, you know, quote unquote, in, in your life, Every day is a new beginning. Every day is a, a new opportunity to change the course, change the direction, change the, change the path that, that you have been living on. And there's, there's success by the world's eyes. You know, um, success out there in the world is that you, you go out and you strike it rich somehow, that you, you become wealthy and you're able to live the life that you want to live. And, and, you know, you just kind of do your thing and, and that, that's success. But I, w I want to give you a different type of success. I want to give you not worldly success, but I want to give you the key to living with godly success. That when, when God looks at you, He says, that's what I'm after. That, that is a good job. Now, I would be willing to guess that, you know, all of us hope and, and dream and plan and, and are trying to live lives that, that are successful. You know, and maybe even to strike it rich. And, and there's nothing wrong with that per se. But again, if we don't have our priorities in the proper order, then we can be a great success from the world standpoint and be an absolute failure when we stand before God. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul. Is anything worth more than your soul? And obviously, the, the, that rhetorical question is answered by saying, no, nothing is more important than your soul. Because when you step into eternity, that's a long time. And the condition of your soul is going to determine a lot about your eternity. Now, let's don't lose sight of what is most important in life. You know, believe it or not, it's not making money. What is most important in life is not living a comfortable life. What is most important is our relationship with God. And if you miss that, then you miss everything. So the message this morning is one about being in step with God. I use the example of the Israelites. In the Old Testament, as you read through, they were constantly messing up. They were constantly drifting away from God. And as they dr would drift away from God, God would raise up prophets to, to basically say, hey guys, let's straighten this up. Let's get back where you're supposed to be. Let's, let's get back to doing what you know is right. And eventually, they would have to be punished. They would have to be judged by God. And in the book of Jeremiah... They had been warned and warned and warned to straighten up. And finally, God took His hand of, of protection away from them, and they were attacked and carried off into slavery by the Babylonians. And so, Jeremiah, part of Jeremiah is him writing to those individuals that have gone off into, into slavery. And... As you might guess, um, they were very depressed. You know, they they were hopeless. They were sitting there saying, "Wow, this this is terrible. This is not the way um, things were supposed to happen." And so Jeremiah, speaking on behalf of God, communicates with them, 
And in Jeremiah 29, he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for peace and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me and and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Now, this scripture, even though it was written by Jeremiah to the people in bondage, it still has application to us because God hasn't changed Remember, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what this tells us is that God has a plan and a purpose for each and every one of our lives. And no matter how bad things might get, no matter how how far off track we might find ourselves, the reality is, is that we never have gone so far that God says, I don't know where you are anymore. I can't reach you. God has a plan and a purpose. And so if we want to achieve God's plan and God's purpose, if we want to be in the center of God's will, if we want to live a life that is successful from God's standpoint, then there are some things that that we need to do. They need to become a part of who we are, a part of the way we live our lives. Now, The first step, if you will, in walking a path of biblical success, walking the path that God says, I applaud this, I I approve of this, is to have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, if we can't do anything that pleases God until we have Christ in our lives. And so this is the this is the first step. And the way we, we move forward from there is that we allow the Bible to become central in our lives. Um, in Jeremiah 29, 13, a scripture I just read, it says, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So we are to seek after God. We are to search after God. You know, in in its theological context here, what that means is that we become a serious student of the Bible. Um, In Ezra chapter 7 verse 10, it says, Ezra had determined to study and obey the laws of the Lord. Let Let me break something to us here. God is not some chump who sits by the phone just waiting for us to come to Him. He is the God of the universe. It is our privilege to be able to come into the presence of God. It is is our benefit. We are the ones who are enriched. We are the ones who, who are rewarded when we seek out God. And so we need to understand this. Again, this comes as a shock maybe to some people. Believe it or not, the world does not revolve around us. That's that's just... that, That can't be true. Everything revolves around God. Everything. 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 And so... It is our responsibility to pursue after God. And it is our responsibility to become serious students of the Bible so that we can become uh, more knowledgeable and so that we can become more Christ-like. Again, the idea of studying the Bible isn't so you can win Bible memory contest or that you can win when we play the occasional game of Bible trivia. The the goal of studying the Bible is to become more like Jesus Christ. The more we study the Bible, the more we get it on the inside, the more Christ-like we can become. Every Christian has a responsibility to pursue after Christ through the Word of God. 
In Psalm 119, begin with verse 9, it says, How can a young person stay on the path of integrity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, Lord. Teach me your decrees. What that means is that we... We are pursuing, we are going after God, and we're using the Bible as our primary tool to to learn and study and get it on the inside. You know, Jesus was tempted all the time. Satan was constantly trying to trip him up. And one of the things that when Jesus, if you remember, after he was baptized, the Bible tells us that he went out into the wilderness and he fasted for 40 days. I have a confession. I have a hard time fasting for 40 minutes. Uh, you know, um, 40 days. That, that, that's a long time. And so as you can imagine, at the end of that, that time, Jesus is hungry. He's, he's beyond hungry. By that point, his body would begin to have been breaking down and, and really starting to, to have some pretty serious things go on. And so Satan comes and he tempts Jesus. And one of the things that he tempts him with is, hey, you know, you're, you're the son of God. Why don't you just, you know, no one's looking. Why don't you just turn some of these rocks into bread and eat? You know, I, I won't tell anybody. It, it'll be okay. You know, that, that's a temptation that's very real. Because, but the reason it's wrong is because Jesus didn't come to be served. He came to serve. He didn't come to glorify Himself. He came to glorify God. And so as a result, to use His, his gifts to help Himself would have been wrong. It would have been inappropriate. And so... Jesus, instead of saying, well, I'm, I'm not supposed to do stuff like that, or, or I, I, I'm going to think about something else so that I don't, I don't get tempted, He used the Word of God. That's how He combated. And so Jesus says in Matthew 4, it is written, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. What he's communicating is that the Bible becomes what feeds us spiritually. You know, if you're not feeding on the Word of God, then spiritually speaking, you're sick. You are malnourished. You are in a state of spiritual starvation. And so it is critical that we are students of the Bible. Now, Jesus... Jesus understood how important the Word of God was in His life. And I want to just place this out here for you, for you, you to think this through on your own terms. If you are not hungry for the Word of God, if you don't really have a sense of wanting to be in the Bible, wanting to study the Bible, and you consider yourself a Christian... That is a serious red flag. Be alarmed if you think you're a Christian and you're not hungry for the Word of God. Because if you're not hungry for the Word of God, there's something broken with you. There, there needs to be something corrected. So I say that not as, you know, not to be mean, but just the opposite to say, Wake up, realize there's something definitely off if you're not in the Word of God and yet you consider yourself a Christian. Now, we, uh, we need to understand that we're all going to be tempted. We're all going to be challenged. And, and certainly the more you live for God, the greater the challenges are going to come up against you. And again, I, I, I've already mentioned that Jesus is tempted constantly, but because he never gave in to that temptation, he was able to fulfill God's work. And he handled temptation by, by being obedient 
to God by being in the Word of God. Now, Jesus didn't have a Bible like you and I do. They had scrolls at the temple. And so he had made it a practice of memorizing all of that and and getting that all on the inside of him. And so what we need to understand is that we need to get the Word of God inside us. Jesus said in John 4, My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. Each and every one of us has a calling on our life. The Holy Spirit's call on your life is for you to do the will of God, for for you to complete the work that He placed you on this earth for. That is your number one act in life. You know, a lot of times we think, well, I need to get through college, and then I need to get a good job, and then, you know, I'm going to be married and have kids and raise my family. And that's not first, that's not first priority. First priority is to live for the cause of Jesus Christ. Nothing else can challenge that. Every day, ask God, please, Lord, make me sensitive to you. Please, God, help me to fulfill your work in my life. Help me to be obedient to you. You know, all of us at one point or another have had some sort of a medical issue. Um, You know, all of us have been to a doctor for one thing or another. I have bad news for all of us this morning Each and every one of us has a horrible, deadly disease called sin. It is a spiritual disease. It's not a physical disease. But every physical disease we have is a side effect of the spiritual disease called sin. Every one of us are afflicted with this. And just like in a medical situation, if you want to get well, you go to a doctor and the doctor says, this is what's going on and this is the treatment regime to correct it. You know, if it's an infection, you take antibiotics. You know, if you have cancer, then you take chemotherapies and you take radiation therapies and you do all of these. Isn't it interesting they call those therapies? Ooh, that's some tough therapy. Um, But the reality is, is that all of us need to deal with this disease called sin. And the only way to be made well is by Jesus Christ in our life. Now, here's the problem. Once Jesus Christ comes into our life, we are healed of the disease of sin, but we will suffer the side effects the rest of our lives. We will suffer from the, the, the different issues that sin causes. And the only way that we can keep those side effects of sin from completely tearing us down is to take our daily medicine of the Word of God. The Word of God becomes what keeps that sin from ruining us. It's what keeps us um, healthy and safe. Just like when you're going through some sort of a, a medical process, they tell you these are the things to take and these are the things to stay away from. Well, the same is true for, for our situation here. The daily study of the Word of God, the Bible, becomes the medicine and it becomes the nutrition that you have to have in order to stay spiritually healthy. Again, you're going to have the symptoms of the disease the rest of your life. But that daily treatment is what keeps the sin from becoming worse, the the side effects from becoming worse. So my question to you this morning is, Are you hungry for the Word of God? Is that something that you desire on a daily basis? Please hear me. If you are not, there is a serious 
serious problem in your life. And you need to get before God and say, God, I, I need you in my life. I, I need more of you in my life. I've already read from Psalm 119, but I want to read the next section, beginning with verse 12. It says, I praise you, Lord. Teach me your laws. With my own mouth, I will tell others the rules that you have spoken. Obeying your instruction brings as much happiness as being rich. I will study your teachings teachings, and follow your footsteps. I will take pleasure in your laws and remember your words. That needs to be the mindset that, that is present in each of us. Again, if you're not craving, spending time with God, spending time connected to Him, there is something wrong. Please hear that. It means that you need to get before God and say, God, I, I need help. I'm, I'm in trouble here. I, I, I thought maybe I was saved, and, and am I? You know, Because if you're not craving God, there is something broken. Now, once you begin to regularly read and study the Bible, things are going to begin to really change on the inside. You're going to begin to see things differently. You're going to begin to feel about things differently. Things that you used to be okay with, you're not going to be okay with anymore. And you're going to begin to desire new, new connections with people because you're, you're going to begin to recognize that people who are not a part of, of God's plan or a part of God's, God's connections, uh, you know, all of a sudden you're, you're not in step with them anymore. Things, things just change. And so what becomes really important to you will be prayer. You'll begin to crave praying because Prayer is the way that we connect with God directly. Uh, you know, Jesus prayed all the time. He prayed about everything. If you read through Jesus' life in the, in the New Testament, He was constantly separating away for prayer, getting up before everyone else to pray, doing different things where He could spend time in prayer. And His disciples saw this, and so they came to Him and they said, Lord, teach us to pray. You know, it should be a natural part of your daily life. You know, several years ago, there was that campaign, What Would Jesus Do? And so everybody had WWJD bumper stickers and bracelets and study Bibles and all kinds of stuff like that. And the whole point of it was to, to basically say, as I live my life and I come up against different situations, what would Jesus do? How would Jesus handle this situation or, or that situation? Well, when we look at the life of Jesus, what, what did Jesus do? He prayed all the time. And so, if Jesus, who is the Son of God who lived a perfect life, who lived an absolutely holy and righteous life, if He depended on prayer constantly, how much more important is it for us to depend on prayer? You know, that, that makes perfect sense. In Hebrews 5, it says, In His life on earth, Jesus made His prayers and requests with loud cries and tears to God. Because He was humble and devoted, God heard Him. So, we should understand the value, the importance of prayer. And we should, as 1 Thessalonians tells us, pray without ceasing. Never stop praying. Have a constant conversation going with God. So that as you're driving down the street and someone cuts you off, instead of saying, that idiot, you know, or, or whatever else we might say, um, that, that was the church version. Um, instead of saying things like that, because we're in a constant conversation with God, we say, God, strike him dead. You know? <laughs> no, not really. We say, oh Lord, please come upon that man and let... Let your spirit fall on him. And you know, you, you know what I'm saying. You know, we pray constantly. 
You know, it, it, we need to understand prayer is not us telling God what to do. Remember, this is the God of the universe. There is no other God but Him. We're not telling Him what to do. Again, He's not some chump. He's not some genie who follows our instructions. He is the God of everything. And so what we do through prayer is realign ourselves to be in line with God. God's plan is what matters. So our job is through the reading of the Bible and the leading of the Holy Spirit, we change to become more and more and more like Christ. And our prayer life becomes critical because when we understand this, then we're going we're gonna to become more like Christ. And that's the goal. So again, to live a life that is successful from God's perspective, we have to commit our life to Christ. There, there's no wishy-washy room here. We have to be completely devoted that Christ is the boss of my life. And then the second thing is, is because I understand He's the boss of my life, I am going to do anything and everything I can to be in alignment with Him. I'm going to get into the Word of God so that I can learn about Him and I can become more like Him and I can, I can understand the mindset and the heart of God because I'm spending serious time in the Word of God. And then I'm going to spend an equal amount of serious time just praying. Praying for what God has laid on my heart. Praying for those people around me who, who are unsaved. Praying for those people who in my life are my enemies. Praying for people uh, you know, who, who are, are struggling. Praying for people on the other side of the world who God lays on my heart. And, and we understand how critical this all is. You know, it doesn't matter if you're 18 or 80. You know, as you progress through life, you're, you're going to have more and more struggle, more and more challenge, more and more temptation. In Proverbs 16, 9, it says, People can plan what they want to do, but it is the Lord who guides their steps. You know, in, in order to, to live a life that God honors, we have to allow God to guide us. We can make plans, and, and we should, obviously. We should have a direction that our life is headed. We, we have responsibility to work and to pay bills and to, to raise our children in a godly home and, and all of those things. You know, that's all critical. That's all important. And to try and do that apart from being plugged into God is nonsense. You know, we, we can't help but mess that up. So understand that anything and everything that we do that is outside of God is garbage. We could become the greatest thing ever. You know, what, what, whatever chosen field you want to pick, you could become the absolute best at it. But if you're doing that apart from the leadership and the guidance of God, it's garbage. It doesn't matter. Because when you stand before God, He's going to say, I didn't, I didn't direct that. I, you, you did that on your own. Uh, and I, I want no part of it. We need to understand that. Everything you have, everything you are, everything about you is a gift from God. And so it becomes our responsibility to be good servants of God. In 1 Corinthians 4, now the most important thing about a servant is that he does just what his master tells him to do. When you get old, you know, like me, um, you know, what you have done for Christ is all that's going to matter. When you stand before God, what you did for Christ is what he's going to look at and say, good job. Well and done. Or he's going to say, you didn't do anything for me. You lived your life how you thought best. You know, Frank Sinatra was famous for that song, I Did It My Way. 
Uh, I, I have bad news when Frank went and stood before God. Um, I'm pretty sure God would say, hey, well, you didn't do it my way and that's all that matters. Because God is God, we're not. We have got to break out of this mindset that somehow we're able to just do whatever we want and then say, hey, God, bless this. God says, I'm not blessing anything that I didn't author. You know, there are doors that all of us walk through every day. And we have a responsibility to live the life that God has called us to. It's not our job to just do what we think best. It is our job to come before God, to study, to understand, to speak to, to, to spend in detailed time getting to know the heart of God and then living a life that is obedient to the very best we know how. And then allow God to, to be honored and glorified by what He can do through us, not what we just do on our own. Be hungry and thirsty for God. Pray for understanding and wisdom that the Holy Spirit will lead you in life. You know, and, and, and ask God to make His truth real in your life. He rewards those who diligently seek Him. You know, it is God's divine grace that you have everything that you have. Your skills, your talents, your abilities, your health, you know, everything you have is a gift from God. It's on loan. One day, each and every one of us is going to stand before God and give an accounting of what we did with the life that God gave us. How we used it. What we used it for. And if we used it for our own selfish advancement, it's not going to go well with God. But when we stand before God and He says, good job, you did what I asked you to do. You, to the best of your ability, lived an obedient life. Then God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into my rest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You. It's truly amazing when we stop and just consider the fact that <laughs> You know, all of us are messes. You know, we are all afflicted by sin. We are all struggling. We are all in a situation where we, we fail constantly. And yet you love us and you have called us into a relationship with yourself. That is truly amazing. And so, Father, my prayer this morning is that each of us would stop and just understand what a privilege we have to be invited into a personal relationship with Almighty Sovereign God. And I thank you for Jesus and the fact that you have blessed us by giving us the gift of salvation and the fact that you invited us into this relationship. Please help us to live lives that honor you, live lives that glorify you, live lives that make a difference for you, not on our own power, but under submission to you. Father, that is my prayer for myself, and that is my prayer for each and every person here. And Lord, this morning as I speak, if there are individuals, God, that are not yours yet, who have not turned their life over to you, I pray you would especially speak to them right now. Impress upon their hearts their need for you, that they are, they are separated from you, and that unless they turn themselves over to you and, and submit themselves to you, they, they will spend eternity in darkness, in, in agony, separated from you. Please help them to understand that. And, and Lord, help them to understand your great love for them. Thank you so much, dear God. I pray now that this, this time of invitation will be your time for your will to be done. 
And it is in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.